All right, everybody, we're starting to record this now. Um, I guess we're good to go, huh, Richard? Yes, let's do it. I let's do that. it. <laughs> Here we are at our third low res. It's, um, I don't remember when we started our first one, Rashad. It's, uh, it feels like a month now. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these, these things keep going. So, you know, we're, we're very thankful to, you know, for, to everyone who's taken the time out of your busy day at home uh, to join us today. Um, so today's low res is, is something that we've wanted to do for a while, uh, which is to recognize the work of freelancers uh, in this community. Uh, just because we know it's been a really tough time financially for for a number of freelancers, but also because we, you know, we know that a lot of them have been working on really interesting stuff um, that's out there. So today we've got four uh, very awesome people that we like a lot um, on the show. Uh, Kirsten, Jeanette, Aaron, and Norman, you'll be hearing from them later. Uh, and then, of course, we'll take some questions as well. Um, so, Rashad, see you. Uh, you might be on mute. Uh, Rishad, you're still on mute. Okay. Oh, sorry. Going to present now. Perfect. Uh, let me know if you see my screen. Is that me? I could keep it on my screen if you like. All right. Yeah. Cool. Let's do that. Yeah. So listen, a quick, uh, guys, just so everybody uh, is on the same page and you guys know who we are, we're Alan and Rashad. We're both co-founders of this thing called Splice. And the idea is that we believe the transformation in media in Asia requires the entry of many, many diverse media startups. Uh, our mission is to drive change, radical change, um, hopefully by supporting bold, forward-looking media startups and freelancers in Asia. Um, so we're pretty excited by the numbers, you know, um, here's what, here's what low res is. Um, we're just, you know, it's, it's very COVID driven. It's very forward looking We're um, you know, we're kind of, we're worried about what's going on, but of course we want to, we want to support and champion what people are doing in spite of this whole thing. Uh, this is co um, low res number three, and we're, you know, we've had about 380 um, upwards of that many registrations. So far, it's been 21 speakers, counting, you know, Erin, Kirsten, Jeanette, and Norman. And of those, 12 have been women, nine have been men. We don't like manners at Splice. Um, we've done three continents. Uh, we've done by, I think by the time this one is over, it'll be about 10 hours online. And we like to think we're socially responsible. Um, so yeah, we've got, we've got good signups today. We've, you know, we've got people from all around the world and from, from really exciting, uh, places. Um, East West center is there. Alex is here from Facebook. Uh, Canva is in there. We've got a whole bunch of people, you know, Stuart is here from Travel Fish. We've got people from The Guardian. Um, I know Prue, Prue might be coming from Judith Nielsen. If you, if you aren't here already, Prue, the correspondent is here. The Ken is coming, Open Society, Coconuts. Yeah, welcome everybody. We're really, really happy to see you here. Um, you know, a, a good, um, there are some quick ground rules that Alan will take you through. Welcome. Cool. Well, ground rule number two, at least. Let's go. <laughs> or number three. Um, if you are on, if you're online here with us today, make sure you are on mute if, uh, unless you're speaking. Um, we want your participation, but you know, make sure you only turn on your microphones when, when you're ready to ask a question. Uh, if you are tweeting please tweet with the Splice Lores hashtag. It really helps to get the word out uh, to people who've not discovered us yet. Uh, use headphones, microphones, uh, find a quiet room with good light. Um, and perhaps one of the most important things here, leave your comments, questions, and links in the chat box. Use that as much as you want. Uh, this is a really great way for people to get, get to know you and to hear from you as well. 
Um, if you are recommending a website, for example, just put the URL in there or any link uh, for that matter. Um, keep in mind that also this is going to be publicly available uh, online after the after this is done. It will go straight to YouTube. So you know, pay, uh, so keep that in mind. If if you don't want to be seen or heard, uh, don't ask a question and definitely don't turn on your camera uh, because this will be made public. Um, Okay, be kind, be generous. This is all very stressful time, uh, stressful times for for all of us. So you know we're all here to learn from each other. So let's let's do that. Um, and after this is done, Rishad, over to you for this. So yeah, so um, just just a little quick. Um, you know, after we're done, please please get in touch with each other. Feel free to exchange email addresses or Twitter um, handles in the chat box. Um, we're going to send around a feedback form. Uh, we got a lot of great suggestions from the first one that we did, and we, we've we've already um, uh, done some of those in the following ones. Send us ideas. We're always open for these. Um, we're planning to do a whole lot more low reses. And again, uh, you know, if you go to the website spliceLowRes.com and you go to where Kirsten and Jeanette and Norman and Erin. Um, you know, their sections are, there's a button there that says, uh, uh, tweet this. Um, you'll find a pre-filled tweet if that's your thing. Otherwise, feel free to tweet this with Splice Lores. Um, hashtag. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take you through the program really quickly. This is us doing introductions, as you know. Um, we're going to cut quickly to Kirsten then Jeanette, then Erin, and then Norman. Um, we'll probably just go straight. We might have little bits of questions. Again, as Alan says, just pop your questions in the chat box. Um, ideally, we'll, we'll um, go to questions at the end of, at the, end of the hour, um, eight, uh, 9 a.m. GMT or 5 p.m. Singapore, or wherever it is you are. Um, we are happy to represent your questions to the speakers. Um, and if it works out, um, we'll, we'll, you know, at some stage, feel free to throw your mics open, unmute yourselves and chat. 5.30 is when we will cut to BYOB. Uh, bring out a drink of your choice. It could be coffee for some of you. It could be beer for some of you. And it will be wine for Darate and me. Uh, and we have some plans to take you through. Uh, we have a little thing to throw you away. We're curious to see what you think of it. Um, and give us your feedback and any housekeeping uh, that, that we'll do after that. Um, what's next? So yeah, so, um, so we had, um, as some of you might know, for about two or three weeks, we, we decided we needed some information about the financial conditions you know, at uh, media organizations around the world. We wanted to see how you guys were doing. So we ran this thing called Splice Lights, Splice Lights On. And the idea is obviously try and keep the lights on at, at, these, um, at, at all the media startups and organizations around the world. So we put the word out. Um, we, are, we ran this pretty you know, basic survey that kind of ran through a whole bunch of your numbers. And uh, we asked lots of sort of probing financial information that a great deal of you actually took the trouble to fill out. And we're very grateful for this. So Alan's going to present the report that we put together from 59 of those responses. Cool. So one of the, so what we wanted to get an idea of was what was a condition of, uh, of finances at, at, at newsrooms around the world. Uh, so we had 59 responses uh, over the course of about uh, two weeks uh, when we were asking these questions. Uh, we asked people, um, you know, you know, what, what is your level of, um, uh, you know, um, how was your business affected by, by COVID-19? And the majority of people said, uh, they strongly agree with that statement. We asked them what was your average monthly uh, cost um, because we wanted to get a feel for what types of sizes uh, we were talking about here when it came to, to the newsrooms. Uh, most of the people who responded uh, uh, were in the 10K to 30K bracket. Um, 
We also asked people, you know, in Q1, which of your revenue sources were most negatively affected by by COVID-19. Um, advertising took the, the lion's share here, which is not much of a surprise, given that advertising has gone off a cliff for, for a number of, of, um, of uh, media companies that are out there. Uh, sponsored content was also badly affected, as uh, you know, as seen in the survey. Um, and of course, with, with that events as well, which is not much of a surprise, I guess. Um, we wanted to get an idea also, you know, what was the top monthly cost at these, um, at these organizations? Um, not surprisingly, 91% uh, said that it was full-time staff. Uh, we asked then, what was your second largest cost uh, on a monthly basis? Um, Part-time staff uh, represented about 40% of that one. Uh, so, and then we asked, you know, based on your current financial situation, how long do you expect to keep the business running at its current costs? Uh, this is where it got kind of scary. Um, you know, the majority of respondents, 30% or so, said that they have about a one to three month runway at the current costs. Um, and we also asked, you know, based on your projections, do you expect to cut jobs in the next six months? 40% said yes. 37% um, said maybe. So this was this was pretty alarming for us. Um, we also asked, where do you need help most for the next three months? Uh, operational cash flow came up to be the number one uh, problem to solve there at 32%. Payroll was at 27%. Um, and we also, you know, so what we wanted to do today was to, was to, you know, announce this wonderful um, grant that we're, we're making available uh, as of today. Uh, this is something that we're doing with the Facebook journalism project. Uh, it's a micro grant that we want to put out there uh, to help solve some of these issues that we're, that we're seeing. Um, we are very concerned about about where things are going in terms of uh, finances at, at, at media startups and, um, and organizations. And so we wanted to make sure that we were uh, ready to, to make this happen. Um, Richard, do you wanna quickly run us through this and how it works? Right, so here's, here's a quick rundown before we cut to Kirsten to begin um, the freelancer um, part of this low res, which is all about the freelancers. Um, so it's going to be grants of $5,000 each. 100% um, of those are used at publisher's discretion. We are going to want uh, transparency and accounting. Um, so some of that is measurable metrics. Um, some of it, um, or it's for short term content or operational initiatives um, that are basically delivering COVID related content to your audiences or helping your organizations or your startups actually survive and thrive during and after the crisis. So we'll, um, we'll throw in the link now into the, into the chat and um, you know, we'll come back to this after we're we're done with our four guests um, and our four, our four spe speakers, um, and feel free to feel free to spread spread the word and apply. Um, thank you. Okay, so let's get this going here, uh, Kirsten. If you're ready to to unmute yourself and uh, share your screen, please. Yep. I assume this is working. Yep. Yep. Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to be talking about this newsletter that I do, uh, which I started in. I just realized when I press present, it doesn't show me the notes. Um, yeah, anyway, I started this in April 2018, just kind of as a hobby sort of thing. And, and I remember saying this to somebody. Um, years ago when I said I started this newsletter as a hobby and his first question was um, why does your hobby look exactly like your work uh, and I still haven't been able to answer this question um, but yes I started it because um, 
I felt like there was a lot of emphasis on Singapore as a place for business and finance, but less talk about uh, politics, uh, human rights and social justice issues, which is what I've been covering as a journalist for quite a few years now. And so I wanted to to be able to prove that actually a lot of this sort of thing happens in Singapore. There's a lot that we need to think about. Uh, I also wanted to do it as a response to people who had said, you know, there's no such thing as civil society in Singapore. There's no activism in Singapore. And actually there, there is quite a lot. Not We've got lots of problems, but that it exists. And so I, this newsletter was really kind of to rebut those sorts of assumptions that you know Singapore is very boring and none of these things happened. It's called We the Citizens because that's the beginning of the Singapore Pledge, which starts as We the Citizens of Singapore. Um, so I just kind of started it in, I think, April 2018. And um, the idea was to do it for free every week, so every Saturday morning. And basically, my mother just tells people that I read the news so that they don't have to. And then that's how she tells her friends to read, which is not actually what I intended. But since that was how the user seems to be, the user being my mother, seems to be using it, I thought, OK, maybe lots of other people are using it that way too. Um, yeah, and so I started it with the intention for it of always being free. And then about halfway through last year, so around June 2019, so I've been running it for over a year, I decided Sorry, to Kirsten, just turn may it I, on. Yeah. May I just yep. want to interrupt and say, guys, um, so Kirsten, oh. there's a lot of people uh, complaining they can't see the presentation. Um, guys, if you, if you click to where, um, if you click to the row of uh, people in the chat, you will be able to see uh, the presentation. It says presentation by Kirsten. Ah, you see you it are. in the top right. So just click there and pin it to your screen and you will hear Kirsten talk over it. Let me know if everybody's got that. All right. Okay. All right, sorry, Kirsten, go for it. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, so yeah, so I did it once a week, every Saturday morning, it's still Saturday morning. And in mid June, 2019, I kind of turned on the paid subscriptions option, not because I was wanting to pay all the newsletter, but because I was just kind of curious if like people were willing to give money to it. And as a freelancer, if people are gonna give money to something, I wasn't gonna say no to it. So I, I turned on the option and I called it the, the Milo Ping Fund because I didn't want it to be a formal sort of premium subscription. It was more like I wanted to frame it more as a tip so people can buy me Milo Ping. I was recently interviewed by a journalist who, who admitted that at first he thought Milo Ping was a person, um, but Milo Ping in Singapore is just ice Milo. So it's, it, I don't drink coffee, so like people can buy me ice Milo. Um, and so, I was actually quite pleasantly surprised by the response when I turned on um, the paid subscriptions. I, I said that my Loping funders would occasionally get extra stuff, but I didn't commit to a schedule because I wasn't actually even sure I had the time to produce all that because at the time I was working uh, almost full time with new narrative. And so I just kind of said, you know, you can pay towards this, you might get extra stuff, but you might not. And just on that basis, by the end of 2019, there were 50 people who were Milo Ping funders. And then by mid-March this year, there were 67. And mid-March was when I decided to go back to full-time freelancing. Uh, and then because I was going back to full-time freelancing, I also thought, let's see what more we can make of this newsletter and how, I can, how can I use this newsletter as a platform. And yeah, so between mid-March and now, it's seen quite a big spike. Uh, I actually am not entirely sure what, I've, what, what has caused the spike, but I think people were responding to some of the things that I was doing a little bit differently now that I have more time for this newsletter. So as of yesterday, there were 120 Milo Ping funders. Um, and now there's also the option for some people to, to be a funder at a higher level than uh, 50 a year or $5 a month. Uh, and so what I've really come to appreciate with this newsletter that I've been doing, 
um, is that it's a very different sort of media platform from a tra traditional news publication or even a website. And, and be, as a freelancer, I usually am, you know, reporting for other publications, mostly international publications, and then I have to kind of conform to their style and their tone. But with We The Citizens, I can basically do whatever I want. And it's also a more personal sort of connection with readers. Um, so I don't have to think about, you know, what will hit with an editor. I don't really have to think about clicks or hits or anything. And so I found that with the newsletter, what I mostly think about now is um, the question of uh, how can I be useful? And so how is this newsletter useful to people? Because I think it's a, it's a real privilege to be allowed into people's inboxes because I know I have a lot of emails and I assume everybody else has a lot of emails. It's, it's a real big ask to ask people to read all their emails. So every time I send an email, I want there to be a good reason behind it. There has to be a use to it. It should be useful to you to actually read what I'm sending. And I don't want to like spam you just for the sake of sending out something. And so I found that this whole idea of like, how can I be useful um, really came to the fore because of uh, the coronavirus. Um, I, it was kind of weird timing that I decided to go back to full-time freelancing and then like the real kind of lockdown and everything hit. And I I found that it, it also presented an opportunity. It is very depressing to be, to feel like you have to be locked down, but I felt like it presented an opportunity to find different ways to be useful and that this question was now not only one for me but for lots of other people because now there's a lot of people also sitting at home desperately feeling like they want to feel useful and so some of the hopefully useful things that I've done um, with the newsletter since mid-March was I kind of changed up the format a little bit so now every week I don't just round up the news, but I also provide links to organizations and local businesses that need support. So I link to, you know, donation pages. I link to places where you can get live streams. I link to um, anything, call for volunteers, anyone that needs help that needs to be amplified. Uh, I started doing again, um, this section called Here's a Nice Thing, where it doesn't necessarily need to have any connection to anything about Singapore. It just has to be, like a nice thing. So I share like cute photos of my cat or something funny I found on Twitter. Um, these days, the nice things have also come in the form of giveaways. So what happened two weeks ago, I decided that I wanted to support a local business. And so I went to the website of Ethos Books, which is a local publisher in Singapore. And I just kind of bought 10 gift cards because I wanted to support them by buying something, but I looked through their catalog and I was like, I already have all the books that I want. And so I decided the, the next best thing would be to buy the gift cards and just give it away on a newsletter. So I did that the first week I offered uh, 10 gift cards. And then after that, a reader of the newsletter messaged me and say, I really like this. Uh, can I continue doing it? And so that reader gave me money to buy another 20 which we gave away um, the last Saturday. So over the weekend, we gave away another 20. And then a different reader has now got in touch to say that they are going to be sponsoring um, gift cards for the projector, which is a local cinema that has been forced to close. And so we'll be doing that this week. And then I think the week after there's another bookstore or something that someone else is sponsoring. So I'm hoping to keep this rolling as much as possible, just this, idea of supporting local businesses, but also just doing something nice for each other and giving. So people who have emailed me to ask for the gift card have said things like, oh, you know, last week I was having a really hard time. So it'd be really nice to have something nice. Um, you know, if I can buy a book or something. Um, or someone has said, you know, I have a friend I have in mind who would really like a gift card or other people have said, you know, I've been looking at this book and thinking of buying it for a long time. But if I could have a gift card, that would be great. And so it's it's nice to be able to do that for people. Uh, and also the next main thing was special issues. So special issues um, are kind of 
they're, so they're not the weekly Saturday roundup. So they can come out any other time in the week. And they are either uh, analysis or commentary. So I have surveyed um, readers recently, and a lot of them said that they would like more ana analysis or commentary from me. So sometimes it's that. Uh, sometimes it's just like a roundup of something that happened and just kind of want to get people caught up as to what happened. So recently I did one about this really bizarre roundup um, because the prime minister's wife, Ho Ching, uh, posted about Taiwan donating masks to us. And it was this really bizarre Facebook post because she just shared the link and all she wrote was, uh, and it became really, really big news in Taiwan um, to the point where like the health minister had to address it in a press conference. And so I summed up what happened about that, why, you know, Ho Ching might have said that, what was circulating online uh, and how Taiwan has clarified since. Um, special issues have also included like long reads. So, so my hundredth issue of We The Citizens, I actually replaced the weekly roundup with a special issue that was a long read of over 5,000 words that I wrote in collaboration with journalists in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And most of these journalists were with the Initium. And so we, we had written it together to talk about how at that point in time, Singapore, Hong Kong and Taiwan were seen as the success stories of the coronavirus response. But, you know, all three might be facing new waves and new challenges. So we did a really long one on that, which the Initium published in traditional Chinese on their website. And then I published it in English. So I'm working on another one with the Initium that should hopefully be out by the end of this week. Another long read, again, over 5,000 words about migrant workers and the outbreak in Singapore and all the issues of how it, how it led to this and also what's going on now based on um, what I've been able to gather from the workers that I'm in touch with. Um, so yeah, so these were all kind of things that I've been doing and I hope that it's useful to people. I do see that with the special issues, um, they do circulate. So, and when they circulate, people subscribe. So either subscribe for free or they, they, they sign up to pay. Um, I found that when people saw that I was also sharing links to organizations to support, they, they also kind of felt like they wanted to support the newsletter. So there were, it, it just felt like that it was generating a lot of goodwill by encouraging goodwill for other people as well. Um, yeah, and the next thing was community, so just to create space. Um, I really appreciate this aspect of the newsletter because it brought it back to why I became a journalist in the first place. So I actually started out as a blogger and an activist before I was a journalist. So my work was always driven from wanting to kind of make a difference, wanting to be part of the community, wanting to be able to have space to talk about issues, even if we don't always agree about whatever you know um, we're discussing. And so I was surprised to see like how many people were kind of open to and actually quite hungry for this sort of community. Uh, so I was doing it with the newsletter just kind of, but the newsletter still felt a little bit one way because people, when I say, you know, you can leave a comment, most people usually don't do it. Um, so it still felt like me writing to them. And so before the Singapore circuit breaker lockdown came into place, I just decided on a whim like, what if I started a Telegram group and I only share the link via the newsletter and it would be just a nice place where like readers of the newsletter can congregate and we can like share nice things and send nice photos of our pets or whatever. And so people don't feel so isolated. And I kind of thought that maybe only like 30 people at the most, most of whom would probably already be my friends would join just to like give me face. So I just kind of put the link out there thinking like, okay, whatever, even if it's 30 people, that's fine. Um, when I sent the email out with a link, I actually messed it up as well. <laughs> the link didn't even work. So I had to send a follow-up email with a new link, which broke my own like, don't spam people with too many emails a day rule. So it was really not the smoothest rollout. And I was like, Ugh, I don't know how many people will do this, but um, I was really surprised by it because over 100 people, I think actually over 150 people joined within the first day. Um, and because I was so taken aback with the number of people who joined on the first day, I didn't continue promoting the link. I was just like, I'll just send it out this once and let's see how it goes. And 
as of right now, there are 255 people in this group. Uh, and it wasn't just talking about themselves. Actually, I found that most of the people in this group are talking about society and about um, politics and about labor rights because of the migrant worker issue in Singapore now. And so it was people who really wanted to engage and they've had, you know, long conversations, usually in, quite often not even with my um, input sometimes about, you know, uh, migrant workers, labor rights, politics, policy. Um, there was this one long discussion about whether in Singapore there should be a distinction between when you use the word government and the word state and the word administration. That just went on for ages. Um, and so it was really interesting to see that people were responding to this sort of space. And that just came out of me putting it on a newsletter to say, hey, you know, who wants to have a chat? And so I think that that's really kind of um, been very encouraging. And I think I'm just gonna keep doing it this way. Um, I don't really see the newsletter becoming the major or the main part of my income as a freelancer because it, it would require a lot more kind of critical mass to, to sustain that as a monthly salary, particularly for a place like Singapore. But um, I am interested to see how many more subscribers I can get. I'm actually more interested in the number of subscribers than the, the amount of money that's being made. Um, so I'm, I would like to see how long it would take me to get, now that I have 120, how long it would take me to that, get to 250, for instance, and then from there to 500, because it's also interesting to see um, how much appetite there is for this in Singapore, because there was you know, a lot of independent publications online that I've spoken to are like, you know, not many people in Singapore want to pay for news. Not many people in Singapore will put their money for this. The market is too small. And so I'm just kind of curious seeing like how I can, how far I can go with this. Um, it being just like a one person operation. So it's not like I have overheads really. Um, so yeah, that's mostly what I've been doing so far. Oh, excellent. Um... You have a whole bunch of really good questions that have come in in the chat box. Uh, you, I think you, you kind of answered a couple of those in your in your last remarks there. Uh, Eliza has been actually asking this this question earlier on Twitter as well. You know, um, how do you choose between Substack and Patreon and and other you know other types of platforms? What, how do you settle on Substack? Uh, I settled on it because it just seemed very easy to use. Um, I have used MailChimp for other things before, but I felt like there were too many things going on. I just wanted something where I could write and send. Um, so so that's how I ended up on Substack. It just seemed much easier. Um, I didn't do Patreon because I... I, I was looking at the, the tiers of rewards and things like that, and it felt a little bit too complicated, especially because when I first started, it was meant to just be a free email blast. So when I first started, I really hadn't thought about money at all or rewards or you know encouraging people to join at whatever tier. So it, it really was just Substack. It's a clean and easy way to send things to people. Um, the other question, oh, the proportion of paid subscribers. I actually don't know most of them, I would say, or at least I don't know them personally. I occasionally will see an email address that I kind of know and I know who that is, but quite often I also just like, I get the alert that someone has signed up and I have no idea who that is. Uh, what else do we have here? We've got a couple more. Um... Stuart McDonald from uh, from Troublefish. Um, how do you split between paid and free subscribers? Uh, Substack suggests a 10 free to one paid as a benchmark. What has your experience been? So as, as in like 10 paying subscribers to, no, 10. Rather 10 free, free to one sign paid subscriber. To yeah, as a, as a um... way to get the word out about, you know, and, and let people sample your, 
your product uh, and then charging them for for it. What's your experience on that front? I I only this month discovered that you could turn on like thirty day free trials for Substack. So I've I've only just done that. I found that um, so so out the hundred and twenty paid subscribers, but the total email list that I have is. Uh, 1,632. Um, so it's still, it's still, you know, there's still like a small minority of people who are paying. But um, at the moment, a lot of things are kind of going free as well, because I didn't want to pay all the COVID stuff. Um, and one compromise that I got, uh, came up with was that um, I email I set it to email the fund, the people who are paying first, so they get it in their inbox. And then later I change the privacy on the website so that I can share the link on social media. So if you're a paying subscriber, you get the convenience of it just sent, being sent to you. And then, but other people, if they, if they want to read it, they can get the link and read it as well. Um, and I think that works because some of the paying subscribers say they, they're also paying because they're not on Facebook, so they like that somebody is like some summarizing all this stuff on Facebook, so that they're not missing out, even though they don't want to be, you know, having to that like they're not social media people, so they they just don't um, follow all the mm. all the posts. And also on Facebook, a lot of the times you have to already be following the right people who are discussing this issue for it to pop up on your feed. So I've I've heard people who say like. Um, they just like that I'm summarizing that for them. Mm, that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, why don't we take one last question here? Let's go to, to Mike Tatarski's question. Mike is in uh, Vietnam. Uh, happy to have you here. Uh, his question is, how long did it take to start getting traction with funders? Um, I wasn't paying very much attention in the beginning because there was so much uh, option, just, just offering people an option to, to take. So I think between between June 2019 to, to December 2019, there were 50 people um, through practically zero effort because I just kind of left it there as an option and then didn't say anything about it after. Um, so it's only really from mid-March till now, which is about a month and a half, that I started to like talk up subscriptions a bit more um, and and to commit more to say I'll do special issues for subscribers so I was quite surprised by that jump from 67 to 120 um, I actually didn't think that it would jump quite so fast but I did find that when I did special issues that touched on particular things that resonated with people then that's when the subscriptions came in so I did one I did an analysis piece on a leaked audio clip of a of our minister for trade and industry talking about Singaporeans um, rushing to the supermarket to hoard, and he was he was speaking in this very straightforward way, which some people found to be quite rude, and I was, but other people were like, oh, you know, what a straight talker, we love this guy, and so I did a commentary piece on that that spread further than I thought it would, and quite a lot of people then signed up after that. Thanks, Kirsten. I think we're gonna yeah, thank you. we're gonna we're gonna stop uh, the questions now because. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was amazing. You know, I especially liked how you said, "How can I be useful?" It's not something you hear journalists uh, say very often, or activists for that re for that for that. Uh, you know, and I I love that. I and I was curious. You know, there's so many ways to do that. Either you tackle a product, or you do uh, an issue that you know speaks to people and you know what's on people's minds no i love that yeah hey we're gonna go to um guys uh, just a quick reminder if you're not speaking let's mute um i'm doing i'm i'm being very rude and playing you know we're we're doing god mode and so we're muting people um uh but yeah no feel free to mute yourselves uh because we're getting some little bits of static so we can have the speakers speak we're gonna jump to jeanette jeanette are you all ready um, Jeanette is 
you know, she's she's done so many things I can, I, I can barely keep track. I mean, you know, she's you, you've been a ghostwriter. I've always been excited about what that how that actually works. And, you know, you've written copy for e-commerce websites. Um, Jeanette is in in KL um, and started at Star Media Group and then moved into Corp Comms and then content marketing. Um, and then you quit your job, learn to code, and then you bootstrapped an e-commerce business. And, and I love how your bio that we put on the website says that you were slowly finding your way back into journalism. Tell us about that. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, can everyone, can everyone see and hear me? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Jeanette's okay. got a presentation going guys. So, so make sure you get to the, get, get to it from the people tag tab. Okay. So I guess, um, a lot of people probably don't know who I am because I haven't been in the journalism industry for that long. Um, quite inexperienced in that area, I guess. Um, and yeah, I've been freelancing for about five years, uh, started an e-commerce business um, during that time. And um, by the end of 2018, I had sold off that business. So I spent a year um, sort of like trying to get trying to see like where I could get back into journalism again. And at the time I was very interested in uh, the F and B industry. So I spent um, that year bartending as well while looking for uh, places where I could write about drinks. Um, <clears throat> but when um, this whole COVID-19 thing happened and the MCO started in Malaysia, um, two of my clients, uh, actually experienced like really bad weeks of like zero sales. Um, so I kept checking in with them to see if like uh, they would still be able to handle my fees and things like that. And eventually we decided that it might be best to put it on a pause for a while. Um, and then I had two other businesses going that um, had to be put on pause as well because uh, one involved uh, events as well as um and my partners in that business were in the healthcare industry, so it's a very busy period for them too. Um, and then the other business involved uh, going in and out of uh, villages in Sabah, so um, that one has to be put on hold for a while too. So my monthly income has actually dropped by at least uh, 60%, which is very scary, especially because um, my husband is uh, freelancing as well. Um, but um, I think like, in order to like get myself out of that anxiety mode, I actually had a look, had a good hard look at my finances, looked at what kind of projects I had in the pipeline. Um, and I saw that, okay, I actually have a decent runway. Um, so I kind of saw this as uh, an opportunity to do more of the things that uh, I've been wanting to do because um, as I mentioned, I've been trying to you know do more journalism um, and less of the less, less marketing and um, like com commercial sort of work. Um, and so I saw that this might actually be a chance for me to do that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the things that I, I've been working on is actually uh, with an NGO called Project Dialogue. Um, it's a program to promote uh, religious freedom in the media. And I thought that uh, like with this time now, it's given me an opportunity to think about this uh, project a lot more. And um, it's been a good mix for me, like it has project management, but it also, it also gives me a chance to get to know about what's going on in the media industry again, like what kind of uh, things journalists are going through. Um, and it's also let me see, um, you know, like new, new media things that people are doing like on TikTok or even using memes as a tool for um, for like getting information, important information to people. It's a great way for like social commentary as well. Um, and because I have more time now, I've been able to sort of like, you know, edit videos and uh, produce content for this as well. Um, and then the other thing I recently started is also a podcast um, for solo, solo entrepreneurs. Um, it's been something that uh, I thought about a lot for a long time and I've spoken about it with um, my partner that I'm doing this with, who's uh, uh, been freelancing for the past year as well. 
um, you know, because I think because I've had some experience with freelancing, I get a lot of questions from uh, new freelancers asking like, oh, is it better for me to like register as a business or should I do it as an individual? Should I hire an accountant? Things like that. And that made me realize that while there are a lot of resources for like the creative side of things or like the marketing side of things, um, there may not be as many resources for like the business you know, the business side of things in a way that's specific to uh, Malaysia, because as you know, like regulations may be different and things like that. Um, so besides those two things, um, I've realized that uh, while, while some businesses are suffering, there are other businesses that um, are actually seeing this um, lockdown as a way to grow their market share, like tech companies, um, uh, I have I, I have a new client now who does um, healthcare, uh, and they're seeing this as uh, an opportunity for them to move online as well. So I've been doing more uh, web development work uh, and um, ghost writing for uh, companies that um, that you know are seeing this as a way to get a message out that you know they're around. They want to grow their market share. So for example, one of the recent pieces I wrote was for a machine learning. Uh, company I ghost wrote for their CEO about um, business continuity during a crisis, you know, and having how having like a remote workforce um, can be handled. Um, and then just to try something else out as well, since I have time, like I started doing some beta reading on uh, Fiverr. Um, uh, I started some of my own like experiments as well. Um, you know, I mentioned that um, I wanted to do more F and B writing, and since you know, I don't, I, I don't get to go out to bars and things like that anymore um, to write for other publications. I started writing more on my own um, Instagram account, um, and it's more of like exploring food, uh, and, and it's more about like history and culture and science, not just about the food and how it tastes. Uh, Medium has been has been pretty good for me. Um, because I didn't necessarily need to be like a well-known name or, uh, or you know, someone that uh, like a celebrity or an influencer or, a, you know, like a journalist that people already know. Um, what I found on Medium is that if you write uh, really good pieces, um, well, I, I guess really good is subjective, but if you write decent pieces that are readable and valuable to people, um, and you get curated by editors of publications or, my, or by medium themselves, um, you can actually make, uh, this can actually be a pretty good uh, source of income as well. Um, and then one of my hobbies is actually reading about mermaids. Um, I like how mermaids are like a symbol of a lot of different things. Um, so I decided to share some of my readings in a newsletter that I publish on Substack as well. Um, <clears throat> and then because I, I have time and I've always been um, interested in writing fiction, um, two of my pieces have been published in anthologies. And uh, this year I was actually supposed to be working on a collection of short stories with a local publisher. And it's something that I've always been like, you know, putting on the back burner. It's always taken a backseat to uh, work that I, that I get paid immediately for. Um, but I guess this time has given me a chance to um, sort of like work on my fiction um, a bit more. Um, and I also have been exploring uh, songwriting and product music production, um, as well as learning uh, UX design, just so you know, in, when all of this is over, um, perhaps I'll have some extra skills that can be um, used in the workforce in a different way or, you know, can help me to um, sort of like stand out a little bit more as a freelancer. Um, yeah, so that's what I've been up to and how I've been uh, handling um, all of this that has happened. And I hope at least some of that was uh, valuable for at least one of you. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh my gosh. It's like, you know, what have the rest of us been doing with our lockdowns? Um, look at all the amazing stuff you're doing. That's, that's incredible. Uh, all right. You've got a whole bunch of questions. Feel free to, to, to jump in there and, and, and have a look in the, uh, in the chat box. 
Uh, Lillian Rogers uh, asks, um, how do you narrow down your content focus and what your beat is? Uh, her second question is, how does ghost writing work? I've always wanted to know myself. Um, right. So content focus, I think one of, one of the issues I've always faced is that um, I've been interested in a lot of different things. Um, I try to find a way to sort of like uh, combine all of it together so that I have more uh, time, I guess. It's more efficient. Um, one of the, like, for example, what I write a lot about on Medium is um, like how to handle a lot of different things that's going on. And that those articles are actually written um, based on like tactics that I've tried out myself uh, when handling all my other different work. Um, so writing those things have been pretty easy. So I guess like that's how I decide like what, what to do. It's things that I've actually um, experienced or I'm already doing and, uh, and, and just producing content for it. It's just a, not that much of a stretch. Um, for ghost writing, um, I think it, it's quite similar to, it's quite similar to editorial writing, I guess, but, um, people come to me and say that they want like a piece of content about this particular topic. And sometimes I don't even know uh, who I'm writing it for, but um, they'll just say it's for, it's for one of their C-level executives or whoever. If I can, I would try to uh, meet up with um, the person that I'm writing for if they already know uh, who's going to be, who's, you know, whose name is going to be on that piece um, and try to, you know, get into their, get into their voice, you know. Um, I think that's something that I've uh, always enjoyed doing, like imitating other people's voices when writing. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if that answered the question well enough, but it's, it's similar to any um, editorial sort of work, I guess, just that um, it's not your name on it. And, uh, you sometimes need to understand how the other person sounds so that you can imitate them. Cool. Uh, Nathan is asking any tips or strategies for staying organized when you're working on so many different projects and, uh, you know, with the diversity that, that you have in these? Um, I use, I actually, I'm actually not a very organized person. Um, the only two tools that no. I use to like, what? <laughs> no, I am quite disorganized. Yeah, I use um, Calendar and the Notes app on Apple. So I have like checklists uh, for like things I need to do every day. Um, and then my calendar is like my lifeline. If it's not on my calendar, I can actually sometimes uh, forget what's going on. Um there's a there's a question here from uh, from Merga. Um, how do you tell people about what you do, and how do you gain subscribers for? Uh, and I'm guessing she means the newsletter. Uh, she mentioned earlier that I love the idea of doing a Substack newsletter based on a super niche obsession. How do you tell people about it? And how do you get subscribers? Um, so because it's pretty new, I have very few subscribers, like less than ten right now. Um, and it is it is very it is very niche. But um, what I've done is uh, shared it on my social feeds. Um, Try to like you know I, I do have some friends who are into mermaids as well, um, and they're part of like the mermaid community. You know I mean there is a community of people who buy mermaid tails and uh, they go swimming with the tails and things like that. So I send it to them and ask like uh, would you be interested in this and um, if you know anyone else who would be interested in it. So I guess in the initial stage, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of like one to one uh, communication as well. Uh, also, a really good question here from Timmy: How do you pitch to medium editors and publications? Um, so, so far, I haven't uh, really pitched to publications. What I've done is um, I write I write the pieces. Uh, formatting is really important on Medium. Like you need to structure it in a way that is um, easily digestible by readers. And then um, after I post it up, so far what I've gotten is that publications uh, contact me or it automatically gets curated by the Medium editors. 
Um, but uh, for Medium's own publications, they have uh, they all have like a submission page where you can read um, the guidelines and what they're looking for. And if you have a piece that's suitable for them, you can pretty much just email them like any other publication. Fantastic. Hey guys, we're gonna we're gonna jump in uh, rudely and interrupt the questions. Um, I we just want to be a little mindful of time. Uh, but listen, we have drinks after this, and you know we're all gonna unmute like crazy. So please, you know, feel free to jump in then and and ask uh, ask you know everybody you want a question, including the speakers. You know. Jeanette, thank you for that. I'm fascinated by a number of things, including what chaos magic is, but I'm going to ask you that at the end. And, uh, hopefully, it's not a scary answer. Um, Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Uh, hey, we're going to jump to Norman. Norman, as a lot of, a lot of you know, uh, Norman Chella is a freelance podcast host. He produces uh, podcasts. Um, if you guys are doing, um, you know, if you're planning a next podcast and you have no idea who, who should produce it, that's, that's, that's what Norman does. One of the many things he does. He also, his, his, uh, so his pod lovers Asia, which is, which is um, something a lot of us um, are present today really love, uh, covers um, um, Asian podcasting and it's very community led and it has you know he'll speak to a whole bunch of people and there's profiles and he'll do interviews with people um, and he also actually just builds podcasts from scratch um, so he does the copywriting marketing he's a full 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 stack podcaster uh, Norman please jump on in hello hello um, let me just turn on my full screen share and is this working? Can you see this? Yes, works for me. All right, okay. Make sure you guys, um, if you see this, uh, people just pin it to your screen and it'll stay there. Yeah, so there's one of the users in the button on the top right would be showing a feed of me screen sharing my entire screen. Uh, so if you can see this giant chicken, then you are on the right uh, screen. So let me start. Uh, well, hi, my name is Norman, and I am on a mission to build Asia's podcast ecosystem. It's a pretty strange sentence to say because there is kind of hard, it's kind of hard to define it, uh, but that's what makes it very exciting. Um, before my diving into podcasts, I was an ex-head of marketing at a Japanese fintech company. We were already doing uh, remote work, wearing multiple hats, and juggling all kinds of deadlines. So I was already used to that kind of agile environment. And I left to do my own freelance initiatives, um, going from freelance writing to ghostwriting as well, um, to starting a podcast. And that one podcast led to two, led to three, led to four, led to five. And now... I run uh, that's the norm.com, which is basically an excuse for me to just make lots of shows. So I call myself the podcast rainmaker because as Rishad has said, I do the full stack for marketing and producing and managing a podcast. And under this website, <clears throat> I have five shows. Uh, don't mind the uh, pictures of myself. Let's just focus on this one because this is the focus of this talk. So out of all of these, the flagship show is Potlovers Asia. And what Potlovers Asia is, it's a show to cover the Asian podcasting industry. And the reason why is because lots of news publications and lots of uh, journalists and reporters would cover all sorts of news and all sorts of updates in the podcasting industry, but it's always global. It's always out West. It's always in the US, UK, Australia, in Europe but barely any in Asia. Um, places like Pod News or Hot Pod uh, would cover all kinds, but there isn't really a source of information for anything in Asia. So I decided to make this brand um, with this chicken, start that, co-organize the first virtual podcast summit. And from there, I connected with all sorts of experts. Uh, 
there are some guests. Uh, maybe you haven't been, maybe you've seen them. Uh, if you listen to podcasts, uh, shout outs to Mike Tatarski in the chat. Uh, I did interview him as one of the guests. So here's to you, Mike. Uh, so there is quite a variety of guests on my show. Uh, we're talking tech in Asia. We're talking independent uh, podcasters with 200 members on their Patreon. We're talking podcaster number 40. We're talking podcasters with over 750 episodes, um, nonprofit podcasts, even Libsyn, Podchaser, Renegade Radio, Australian hosting company, Wushka, and SCMP, the main principal producer behind uh, SCMP's podcast shows. So I go the full range of guests uh, all just to map out the entirety of the scene because there are so many things to cover and that it's kind of hard to find a proper definition of what is the Asian podcast market. So that is what the mission uh, behind the brand is. <clears throat> so now that you know a little bit about what Potlover, Potlover's Asia does, let's talk about the opportunities around po podcasting uh, since this, this outbreak has happened. So there are a few key things that maybe we all have noticed. One is the change in behavior. A lot of people would commute to their offices, um, meet up with people in events, parties, et cetera. And now we are stuck uh, at home, which means that listener um, behavioral changes are quite adamant. Uh, now that you have no commuting time, your commuting time is basically waking up from your bed to go to your office, which is like, what, 10 seconds of walking? and you are immediately at work, which means that huge uh, cutoff time for people who normally listen to podcasts to kill time on their way to from point A to point B. But because of COVID, uh, initially there was a huge decline in uh, listenership in the past month, around 20% global decline, I believe. But uh, people have started adapting and now there are more and more uh, listeners with steady increases in total listenership across uh, podcasts globally, at least, uh, but at different increments, depending on region. So there is a certain level of adaptation, according to people getting used to podcasting or consuming podcasts in, during these times. Uh, there is also a huge surge in COVID-related podcasts, and this brings up sort of a, an interesting issue where, one, you have quite a number of podcasts that are trying to keep up with all the news and updates on what is happening COVID related, and two, people are trying to escape from that. Uh, they want to immerse in something else uh, so that they don't have to deal with in real life worries and real life problems. So there is two main types of listeners, those who want to keep up to date on the latest news on COVID and those who want to escape that by um, gearing towards more positive, encouraging, um, powerful shows. So that's one huge change in listener behavior. Uh, happens in Asia and definitely all over the world. Another one is the feature of work. So lots of companies, uh, especially B2B companies, they have a large amount of their events canceled, um, speaking engagements uh, canceled, and they are now moved to a virtual environment, which means that more and more businesses are, well, because they are going virtual of all their events, that means that there are opportunities for them to repurpose uh, their content, since it's digitized, into virtual format. And most of these tend to be virtual summits or the fireside chats or live events. And people want to consume that in audio form as well. So this is now, yes, it's a bit bleak, but this is now a chance for independent producers to pitch potential shows and proposals to those who may be considering a new marketing channel at very little cost because they already have the content. It's just a matter of turning that into something that they can outsource to us, the producers, and from there create value in a different way. So yeah, uh, the virtual events is actually a plus for podcasters, actually. And the next one is the surge in the amount of podcasts. Uh, since this is now a time for people to be working from home, uh, not being able to go out, there are a large percentage of people who are interested in starting their own show. And just last week, we have passed the 1 million mark, which is pretty interesting because just the month before we reached, I think, 900K, I think February, I believe, February, beginning of March. So 
That's like another plus 100,000 shows and counting. And what's interesting about this is that 46% of them are active, as in there is still a new episode in the last 60, 90 days as of last week, which that comes the hype for the budding podcaster, those who are interested in starting a new show. And that is where I can come in. I can consult them on what they want to do. And it doesn't matter if it's from an individual hobbyist podcaster, I would always help them to a company who is trying to create something on a much more professional level um, with management as well, outsourced content marketing, repurposing, creating social media copy, and uh, so on. My role is uh, as that uh, podcast rainmaker, as someone who is, um, let, let's just say, a little bit more informed about what's happening in the industry, uh, is to one, connect the fragmented Asian podcast markets, to set the example as a career within podcasting, at least in Asia, and three, make some noise through uh, podcasting. So we'll go through a little bit of these uh, bit by bit. There's a reason why I call myself a full stack uh, podcast uh, producer is because people don't want to do a lot of the work. If you imagine one episode to be about five to six hours of uh, planning, production, editing, writing the show notes, social media copy, repurposing, uh, marketing across multiple channels, making the, gra the graphic design, uh, graphic material for that, and much more. And doing that each and every single week, assuming that you're doing a weekly interview show, one, that's a huge time investment, and two, you don't know if you're doing it right, so you want to consult someone who probably knows more about it, and that's where I come in. So not only do I do some form of consulting, but I also turn it into packaged services. So for example, any budding podcaster that wants to start a show by themselves completely, I do it for free, like 30 minutes call for free. I will totally help. I'm always eager to see someone start a new show because it's always so exciting. <laughs> it's always so exciting to see someone start their own show, but for something much more proper and professional, uh, that's when I start to package the services. So when it comes to marketing or producing the show or even outreach to guests and stuff like that. Since the five shows that I've done, two of them are interviews, two of them are narrative, and one is daily. That means that I have ample chances to test out formats, or at least my body of work allows me to showcase a variety of formats for any kind of podcaster. And that would put me in a greater position as well as a, um, as a freelancer and as a consultant. So that's one. Two, uh, in an effort to try to connect the fragmented Asian podcast markets, because we have so many cultural barriers. We have uh, many different listening behaviors uh, other than the one, like even before COVID, uh, many different kinds of listening behaviors. I am on a mission to try to aggregate all that together and connect people with each other. So I launched the Pot Lovers Asia group, which is quite similar to like a Quora or a Q&A forum uh, for people to connect and talk about everything podcast. And see, I have this little circle here. Alan also joined, so thank you. Alan, uh, for joining. <laughs> um, so I've had this project up for quite a while. And uh, since COVID has forced me to change my plans, I could create this and have this launched in a more agile manner. So this just launched a few days ago. So I'm really uh, excited to see it grow. And yeah, uh, I do have a few, a few future plans uh, for, for this brand and this thing uh, over time. Phase one is the group and the newsletter and a directory. Uh, these two are to highlight shows that are popping up across Asia. So newsletter hopefully will be out very soon, but the directory will be a way for us to aggregate all the data of podcast shows that are by country. So if, for example, you know, Jeanette just started a show so I can probably put up all the information onto the directory for shows built in Malaysia or maybe some others in Philippines or in uh, Japan or in Vietnam or in Thailand or in Indonesia, much more. Because uh, awareness and visibility is one of the key factors that we're trying to tackle when trying to define a market uh, in the first place. Phase two will be virtual events. So something like low res, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> uh, surveys and technical data, 
And the reason why I said it specifically like this is because we are missing two things mainly in Asia's, Asia's podcast market. One is technical data and two is community. Um, we have a few sources for technical data and we're talking about the large names like uh, Infinite Dial um, and a few other uh, FGDs that are happening, uh, but it doesn't represent the entirety of Asia. So since this is not at a critical mass yet, the next best thing would be to create a community and from there collectively put our heads together and then see what happens. And the next part would be an academy because I want to serve more and more independent podcasters more. So if there's a way for them to be accelerated, um, I want to define this a little bit more later in the future, but for now, phase one, uh, an academy to help podcasters start their shows in the most effective way possible so that they don't feel so scared about starting their own show. Uh, hopefully I can build that in the future. Uh, and these are some extra ideas, but which are more for a combination of community-based content, uh, more for B2B services. So for hosting companies or podcast related companies trying to tap into the Asian market. I've had a few consulting sessions with them where they want to know about what's happening in Malaysia or what's happening in Singapore, or what's happening in Indonesia, what's happening in the Philippines. Um, so if there's a way for me to provide that, that kind of information as I am learning about it over time, that'll be fantastic. But something to note and something to always remember, uh, this was noted by my recent guest, Evo Terra in a previous episode, who is the person that wrote podcasting for dummies second edition. What works in the West doesn't always work elsewhere. So the business models for podcasting or the models for defining a podcast industry in the US may not necessarily work in, say, Asia. Uh, China has their own business model, lots and lots of premium audio content. Uh, we have Spotify being quite on a high growth uh, potential buying shows, uh, say, in Indonesia and uh, much more. I had a chat with the head of Southeast Asia, a pretty cool guy. Um, but yeah, we are in a moment where Asia's podcast market is very informal. It's in the middle of trying to take shape. So I'm trying to ride that wave and give back to that, just as how podcasting has brought so much uh, to me. <clears throat> so some successes and barriers. Um, as someone doing this, uh, despite the COVID outbreak, uh, having five shows as my body of work is a lot of work hours. It's a lot of, of, it's a large portfolio. So it allows me to be a little bit high ticket in terms of talking about these things with say larger companies or larger entities. Um, not only that, because I have this body of work, because I have Pot Lovers Asia as my professional excuse to connect with other people, my proximity effects are pretty strong. I had a chance to connect with the Spotify team or the head of Spotify team in who is based in Singapore just by letting them know about Polyverse Asia and what it does. And from there, we had a chat with a, uh, like a 30 minute Zoom call and it worked perfectly fine. And any form of imperfect marketing is much better than showcasing a completed product. Uh, I think it really does humanize uh, either the brand or myself uh, personally, if we show something that is in progress. And once we showcase that progress, even if it's not completed, even if it's a passion project, even if it's something that is not uh, as fleshed out, it can still resonate with your audience or your chosen audience much more than all of a sudden saying, oh, we have a completed academy, for example. Some barriers, uh, diversification and attention management is very, very important because Pot Lovers Asian isn't the only thing I'm doing. The other shows uh, are up there as well because of the COVID outbreak. I had a very regular schedule, but it's been affecting me and now I can't, so because one of the shows I write narrative short story fiction. So because of the COVID outbreak, I couldn't really write any more fiction. So a lot of things has been paused. So a few of the shows have been pod fading, which is really, really bad. Um, I've had to start prioritizing specific shows that are gaining traction at the cost of the other shows that I've been building. So where I pay attention to is very important. Um, building a market at infancy stage, very fascinating, very interesting but it requires many different players. So if you're looking for output or results, um, maybe from a financial standpoint, uh, very difficult to see that uh, coming in, you'd have to go more international. A lot of my clients are, well, outside of Asia, 
uh, they are interested or they are interested in the services that I can provide as a rainmaker. And the limits of solopreneurship, uh, I'm doing all of this as one person. So uh, as a freelancer, I'm sure that is quite uh, a common issue um, shared by many others. So, you know, lots of goals, lots of uh, things to do, but there's only so much that one person can do, but still exciting. And I'm still willing to struggle to build this. So yeah, uh, some lessons learned from building Pot Lovers Asia. When I help the few, I share with the many. So helping out the ones who want to start a podcast, helping out the guests who ask for more and sharing that with the rest of the world, just seeing that body of work happen has yielded quite an interesting number of results have been covered in pot news, uh, which had led me to connecting with a producer all the way in New York. Uh, and that's really fascinating. Like people are willing to connect over uh, podcasting. Um, always do your work with an open door, as in showcase your progress uh, to other people. Uh, be careful about juggling too many brands. Um, people can know me as from That's the Norm Media. People can know me from Pot Lovers Asia. People can know me from another show. So that's uh, very difficult. I'm still struggling with that. And always seek help if you need it. And uh, something I just wrote before we started, if you want to cross the sea together, build the boat. Um, since I'm trying to build an ecosystem or I'm trying to help lay the foundations for an industry, that is where I would like to build a boat so that everyone who is involved in podcasting, no matter how big or how small your show can be, um, can you know, we all can help each other out and cross the sea together. So yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, this is the first time I've heard you speak of what you do in the scope that you've kind of explained it as. It's uh, it's really quite remarkable. I really, <laughs> I like I like your approach in it. I also like the fact that everyone on um, on on low rest today is kind of seeing themselves as as solopreneurs. Uh, which is a new word that I've learned, which is why I'm struggling with pronouncing it. Um, we've got a whole <laughs> bunch of questions, and we also have Aaron Cook, who's uh, who's also waiting to 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 present. So let's sure. quickly, you know, jump through some of the questions, and if you can keep your your answers short, Norman, that would be really yep. helpful. Uh, Mike Tatarski, what are some of the challenges and opportunities of podcasting in English in such a linguistically diverse region? Oh, okay. So that, that's a very interesting question because uh, I think we even talked about that in our episode, Mike. Um, so right now, English is the de facto standard language for podcasts across Asia because it is the easiest to gain listeners. Uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the majority of listenership, at least across Asia, they're most likely to consume content that is known not only in Asia, it's not limited to Asia, but also to the world. When you say create a show in English and you showcase it to say a country which is not, you know, English is not the primary language, like say Vietnam uh, or in Malaysia or in, uh, or in Philippines, it sets the example for the different kinds of podcasts that are possible. But you have different barriers and that that doesn't always translate to listeners in many different languages. So if there's a way for you to connect that, um, either connect the host or connect the community with that ho uh, that podcast to those who are willing to start a show in a different language other than English, that would honestly break the cultural barrier or break the language barrier rather much faster. If there's a way for you to either diversify your podcast into a Viet language, Vietnamese language podcast, or encourage others to start their own uh, languages, uh, their own podcast in their own language. That'll be fantastic. Cool. Um, yeah, that's obviously a, a very, it's an important question. Um, Aritra also had the same question around, around that. Um, how did you go about doing, you know, basically regional languages for, for different audiences? Um, I'm just going to quickly, in the interest of time, just kind of move this on. Sure. Uh, Mirga was asking about um, all these changing consumer trends now that we're all at home, you know, um, our commute time is is non-existing, uh, non-existent. Our habits at home are different. Uh, have you found this new window of opportunity that's out there? You know, that's no longer about prime time, prime time viewing or prime time listening. Uh, what are these new new opportunities 
for example? Are they 10 minute windows while you're doing the dishes, for example? Um, what have you seen? Oh, okay. Um, I'm seeing uh, quite a number of opinions uh, from there. Uh, people are more, uh, because of the shifting changes in behaviors, I'll just try to keep the answer short. Hosts are now more willing to try different formats. So those who are trying out who had one hour interview shows are cutting it down to 10 minutes to compensate for the small minutes of time when they're stuck at home uh, doing house chores or something like that. So we are now seeing a trend where shows are diversifying in length. So that's one thing to consider. Uh, more and more people are uh, starting shows in more bite-sized episodes so that it's easier for them to consume content because they're not always in a position to be able to listen to an entire hour for example, or 40 minutes of content in one go. There's always distractions. You're not always in a private space. You know, you're not always just going around your headphones throughout the house when there are other family members there. So there is that. Um, basically, greater shifting changes in podcast length uh, from, from 10 minutes to 20 to 30 minutes, more on there. But there are still lots of long-term, long-form uh, episodes out there. Okay, um, let's do the last question here. Let's take Surya's question. Um, what's the median median number of subscribers per podcast series and how is it usually monetized? And also, is this different in Asia versus maybe in the US? Uh, and what are the opportunities for growth here here in Asia? Median, so wait, so there's, there's a lot to break down that one. So wait, yeah, so that's what's right. The first part? So median, median number of subscribers per podcast series. Oh, uh, globally? Um, I, I'm assuming it's probably Asia. Like, what would a benchmark be like in this region, you know, um, in terms of good numbers? Okay, sure. Um, I'll give you a whole range. Uh, let's, let's go macro. So macro, monetizable podcasts go from 5,000 unique listens per episode globally. Now, if we shift that down to Asia, Monetizable podcasts are probably less than half of that. So we're saying we're talking about 2,000 unique listens per episode. And I'm, I'm not talking about like every week the same. Uh, it has to be 2,000 unique different people. Uh, this is when you want to consider different business models for trying to monetize that. Uh, like, for example, ad slots or trying to determine whether or not that's enough metrics for you to consider taking in money uh, since it is a free piece of content. I can't really give you a median number of podcast series because. One, there are so many different formats. Uh, and two, Asia's technical data is still quite disconnected. We have one of the most best examples of listening markets in the world, which is South Korea, 50, 58% listenership higher than the US. But then we have like uh, other countries which are not as ingrained. So I cannot really answer you, uh, give you an answer for that median uh, numbers. So what was the second part of the question? Uh, let's see. Let me just quickly go back to that. Uh, <laughs> second part of the question is how is this usually monetized? How is it usually monetized? So yeah. we're talking about up to eight to 10 different business models. So, um, if you think about podcasts as a marketing channel, you're trying to market something. So you're trying to get your listener from point A to point B. So if you're selling an ad slot on your, on your show for a brand, that's getting your listener to go from point A to the brand. That's your point B. If you're trying to sell your own product, so that's, for example, a book or a course, that's your point B is your own book and your own course. So uh, the can't go too much into it, but there's about like eight different kinds of business models for trying to get money uh, and monetizing, maybe even email list, maybe even webinar, maybe even something else, a free event. And that's how uh, it's been working. And I believe the last part says opportunities for Asia. So opportunities for Asia, uh, people are willing to connect with each other more because the market isn't so defined yet. So if you are looking at like a thought leader in podcasting, they are more than willing to talk about podcasting with you because there isn't so much of a hierarchy or there isn't so much of a, not too many large players uh, happening uh, in Asia. So I'm not sure too much about, um, about monetizing because there are a few outliers in Asia. There's one in Japan that, reached up to like 8,000 USD a month. There's one in Singapore that's reached up, reached up to a few. One in Philippines, like 5,000 USD a month. So there are opportunities, but they are outliers. I do not want to count them as uh, 
great examples. That's like trying to count a hobbyist podcaster comparing himself to Joe Rogan experience. That's too much, too much of a gap. Um, but in terms of proximity effects, you can connect with thought leaders much more easier if you are trying to be a podcaster in Asia. That's definitely one huge advantage. Very good. Thank you, Norman. Um, all right. Last but not least, Erin Cook, uh, who doesn't need much of an introduction. We all know her. We've, uh, you know, we absolutely love her work here at, at Splice. Erin uh, Cook is an Australian journalist based in Southeast Asia, but currently in Canberra, from what I gather. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, brain. <laughs> is it? <laughs> the color is perfect. Erin <laughs> uh, has a fantastic newsletter, which we, which was how we were first introduced to her. Dari Mulut Ke Mulut, which means from mouth to mouth. Uh, it's a wonderful newsletter that wraps up what's going on in ASEAN, uh, which surprisingly no one else seems to be doing. So Erin, thank you for your work. Uh, over to you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm so glad you had such a nice intro. I'm nervous about this uh, slides because everybody's is brilliant <laughs> and mine is not so great. So let me just grab it. Uh, it is not letting me share. Sorry. Okay. Is that working? Not yet. No. Okay. Can't share your screen. Great. Um, well, I might just start because it is actually a terrible slide, so it's probably not really <laughs> losing much. Um, Go for it, Aaron. Okay. So my newsletter, Darren Mullet, Ken Mullet, I started that about four years ago now. Um, so it's really kind of grown quite a lot. And through that, I've kind of began as a, as a regular sort of freelancer, but I now focus primarily just on uh, newsletters. <laughs> so I do my own um, as well as one for Aussie in the U S and now I'm with coconuts doing Indonesia intelligencer, which is very similar to um, the regional one, but looks specifically at Indonesia, but covers um, economic, political and uh, social news from within Indonesia. Um, so yeah, this, kind of exactly what Kirsten said, where it started out as a, as a hobby side project while I was working in Jakarta, but have now um, turned it into a job, <laughs> which is very exciting. It's changed dramatically since the COVID-19 outbreak in, in a lot of ways that I didn't expect. Uh, I suppose, like, as we all know here in, in Southeast Asia, it's, we've been dealing with it a lot longer than anywhere else on in the world, except for China. Uh, it's been really interesting tracking the development of it from a side story in January, February, or very early February into an all encompassing thing now that I've, I've never dealt with before. Um, there have been instances where that we have had um, kind of during the length of, of doing this um, instances where there were stories that were dominating for weeks on end particularly at the beginning of last year where we had several countries having elections all at once. And I think that's probably the closest thing to what we're dealing with now, but it's completely changed the way I do um, what I do. I ordinarily would just be doing two or three a week with the Monday edition uh, for premium subscribers and then two, one or two free ones for later on in the week. Um, but now there's just so much news that I'm doing it virtually daily which uh, is kind of hard to plan out. I think this is something that I've noticed myself. Um, because it's so huge, so all encompassing, it's hard to identify what should be covered at any given point. There's a very, very big, uh, I don't know, divergence between how much coverage we see across the region. And that's always been a problem. We have um, some areas with brilliant media media access and press freedoms and then we have some that are virtually black holes um and that's becoming more stark as the as the pandemic cracks in which is probably too flippant of a way to say that but um beyond that i do think that there is a degree of pandemic proofness to what i've been doing in that uh the audience base itself is uh particularly the paying 
the paying um, portion of that. I primarily um, employed or interested in ways that um, make the region not, or make, make understanding the region a necessity, I think is probably the best way to put it, where unlike maybe your subscription to the New Yorker or whatever, you're less likely to uh, get, rid of, get rid of it, which is something I'm super grateful for, but also I think shows how um, undervalued the region has been historically by some of the bigger Western outlets. <laughs> um, but uh, now where am I? So that's kind of been the biggest challenges for me. Um, so primarily it's just been, uh, oh, this sounds a bit mean. It's, I don't, there've been a lot of perks to the current situation, I think, in that um, I had been planning to later towards the end of the year, um, expand into um, commissioning pieces and um, yeah, taking on writers, but given how um, how desperate <laughs> we need and how important so much of this news is. I brought that forward by months. And thankfully, I through Substack. So by using Substack, they've offered a very, very generous emergency fund, which means that I've been able to start uh, taking on writers immediately, um, which is brilliant. I've run two pieces from Hyde writers so far, uh, from a Hyde writer so far, and that's in Laos, where there's been virtually no news whatsoever about um, the pandemic. Um, and we're about to run another piece this week for Mike, who's getting a lot of attention tonight um, about Vietnam's response, which I really um, enjoy about, about what I'm trying to do here. It's not so much on the ground reporting that I'm looking for. It's more analysis and interesting thought provoking pieces on what it is that we're um, trying to understand from the region what what is there else to it besides the the devastating data that's piling up day on day on day uh, okay oh I'm being one of those people that just <laughs> waits it out um, so that means that I'm now actively seeking pictures so if there's anybody here and I really really hope there is um, I'm desperate to hear from Pete pictures from across the region, um, particularly Mekong states where media freedoms have been uh, kind of throttled in recent years. Um, and I did have a slide with my email address and all that, but I'll share that later. Um, so I'm not looking so much for reporting. I think that um, the wires are really coming through in the last few months, particularly Reuters. I think they've been outstanding in, in covering the region. Um, I want to hear more from the actual from the people that live here, from us, I suppose. So if you're uh, interested in anything um, in the region, I definitely would like people to reach out. Um, I think it's a very interesting time to begin a, a project as well. I think, uh, I don't know, probably like a lot of people, I'm kind of swinging between, I don't know, just being very depressed about the entire situation and state of the world, but also, uh, kind of a degree of excitement about uh, what is available now. It's, I think we're seeing, a, as the, the splice survey shows, we're seeing a real slowdown in um, more traditional opportunities. And I, I think this does give us some space for uh, building our own stuff. And it does take a long time. For me, this is just last month with the four year mark for me. So it does take a long time, but I think there is a exciting opportunities. Um, I think the region needs more coverage and platforms like Substack or like Norman's podcast are brilliant opportunities for that. And now is a good time to start it given that there's such a huge appetite for news and such a huge uh, scope for what we can now do. I've used Substack for about two years now. And they've recently started uh, added in a function where you can add in your own audio tracks, which is something that I'm a bit nervous about, but um, there's a lot of flexibility in what's available now. And I don't know, I think we can see that um, the success of Kirsten's newsletter and Mike's Viet Vietnam Weekly, which is a very important resource for myself as well, um, shows that there is, as well as Indonesia Intelligence with Coconuts, there is space for 
not hyper specific, but definitely geographical newsletters that can focus on one or two major issues. I like that Kirsten's focuses on underrated, underexplored aspects of Singapore and Mike's on areas that you're not necessarily going to be reading about in AP or Reuters or anything. Um, so there's a lot of room to explore. And I think Substack specifically is probably one of the best avenues to, to go about that. Um, I know people are always, just like Kirsten said, people are always very interested in um, finding out the money and how that all works and everything like that. And I think probably one of the most underrated aspects of that is it's often forgotten that it takes a while to build up that trust. I think with somebody like Kirsten, who's done brilliant work for, for years in the region, um, her initial success says a lot about her kind of standing and reputation in, in the community. But for me, I started it out just as something to do. And it took years to build it up to the point where I was now able to hire on writers and thankfully then got the funding. But it does take a long time to build up. And now is probably one of the best times to do that. Um, yes. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's probably all I've got at the moment. If Alan wants to help me steer the way. <laughs> Erin, actually, yeah. I'll, I have got some steering to do of my own. Yes, uh, please. <laughs> I was, I was curious, you know, so we've seen you come with Dari Mulut Ke Mulut, you know, when you do one kind of whenever you felt like it, and then we be waiting for the next one. And it's like, you know, when is it coming? Then we'd see your round up and stuff and now it's become this regular thing and then you jump to Substack. you're now you know alan said recently that you're you've become a sort of platform now for writers Dari Mulut is now becoming a platform and you're you're asking for pitches and it's great to see that growth so what's next i mean is the formats are you very format specific is it always going to be a newsletter will it will you be hiring norman to do a podcast next or would you be how do you see growth? That's a very interesting way to put it. I don't think I've really thought of it as anything specific beyond just finally the opportunity to kind of uh, ask the writers. I really like to, to write more on what they're good at, but that is interesting. I would like to see more, more uh, homegrown analysis. I think uh, probably preaching to the choir here, but we do see a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of analysis is dominated by uh, academics and experts abroad, which are, is brilliant and they're extremely smart people. But I do think we've got a huge generation of young people specifically from within the region. And I want to continue giving that platform, whether that turns into something beyond Substack or beyond a couple of thousand word uh, emails every few days. I'm not sure yet. I would like to, I don't know, just keep going at this pays for now because I'm not too sure what comes after this it's I think it's very new days for newsletters which is also one of the the great reasons to get in now um I think like it wasn't that long ago that getting an email was one of the most irritating things ever whereas now it's uh I don't know I find myself signing up to three or four a day and then yeah just reading them all so it's I don't know where newsletters are going and that's why I'm happy to be with Substack because they seem to be shaping that sort of conversation. So I've got, um, thanks for that. I've got a question here from Aishwarya. Um, yes. So she's asking that when you start a newsletter, what are the points creators should think upon and be open to while doing the pilot run? Oh, that's an interesting question. I'm, uh, ooh, I think, uh, consistency is definitely one. I think you could write it about anything. You could write it about mermaids, but you have to be consistent in what you do. And I think that's where I went wrong in the early days of mine. Um, and you also have to be hyper aware that that initial uh, huge growth in uh, subscribers will taper out very quickly. And then you'll find kind of a, a natural median that'll just generate itself. You won't be getting hundreds every day, like you may when you first start out. Uh, growth will slow and then that's when you have to start thinking about ways to to continue that growth. And usually that's just hammering it on Twitter and uh, pushing it um, through opportunities like this. 
Yep, yep. Sounds sounds familiar. Um, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a grind, but if if you are consistent, as you said, yeah, it does work. Um, Stuart has a has a has a question, uh, but he also has a comment. Huge fan of your work with DMKM, and you must have one of the most read newsletters specific to Southeast Asia. I completely agree. Looking back over the last four years, what would you say was the one thing you would have done differently if you were starting out from scratch today? Nice question. Uh, that is a good question. I think again, it would be consistency. Um, I think even if you churned out, I don't know. I, don't know, I feel like some some weeks I'll have one good newsletter and then I'll have two kind of okay ones or I'll have kind of okay ones for fortnight and not feel that great about it. But the most important thing is to just get keep getting it out as frequently as you say you're going to. When I first started, it was very much like that. It started off as monthly and then it was maybe fortnightly and maybe weekly. But uh, once I kind of found my minimum, um, which I don't always hit. I don't always hit the the daily target that I'm aiming for during the pandemic, but uh, uh, keeping consistency to your own kind of minimum, I think is key. That's definitely what I, I would have started from from scratch. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, all right, so we're we're approaching the end of uh, of our time here today. So I just wanted to thank you everybody for for taking the time to, to be a part of this. Um, but hey, this is not over yet. Uh, a couple of things. Um, let me just bring up my window here. Um, so, you know, if, if you've just joined us and uh, missed what we were saying earlier about um, the lights on survey that we did and, uh, you know, and some of the issues that we've seen in this space uh, with regard to um, when media is going, the issues that media companies, um, freelancers also are facing uh, in the work that they do. Um, you know, we want to talk about, uh, or just, you know, just a quick reminder that we we just made this announcement early today uh, uh, at the start of the show. Um, you know, we are putting together a, a, um, a micro fund with, uh, with the Facebook Journalism Project very grateful for the work that Anjali and Alex have been have been pushing so hard on uh, for the last few days, um, trying to get this uh, this deal sorted. Um, this is basically a support fund that that FJP um, are are doing. Uh, the goal here is to provide funds of up to of of uh, five thousand dollars in in micro grants, which can be used at the you know, at, at the publisher's discretion. Um, our hope is that newsrooms will take some of this money and allocate that to uh, to the freelancers that they are working with, so that they get to create more stories. Obviously, um, you know, our dream is that black our dream is that you know um, uh, freelancers won't have to go through this <laughs> this incredibly difficult period uh, that that many have been you know uh, going through for the past few months, given COVID and and their ability to work and also their their ability to pay for for health insurance so something like this is very important so if you are a freelancer on this call today uh please reach out to to uh to newsrooms um point them to this to this website that we have uh splicemedia.com slash lights on um work with a newsroom get them to put in an application uh so that they can help distribute some of this funding to you as a freelancer. Uh, our goal is to, is to help um, newsrooms and freelancers reduce the, the pain that they're all going through right now in a time like this. So uh, great effort again by Facebook. Uh, thank you, Alex. You're still on the call, I believe, um, and, and you know, your wonderful team in, in making this happen. Um, all right, that's it for now. Uh, over to you, Rashad. Well, you know, just to get over, um, thanks for the thanks for this, uh, the lights on thing. Um, you know, we're 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 really trying to do our bit here, guys. Um, please spread the word, as Alan said. Um, you know, find the people you work with, find the freelancers, and you know, the solopreneurs that you work with. To use a word that Norman used, uh, and adopt it. Um, I guess that's what that's what uh, freelancers are. And uh, I'm. Uh, should we be? Should we be honored that we were Zoom bombed on Meet or Meet bombed? Um, 
kind of freaky, but you know, there's a good way to, fortunately, there's a good way to get over that. Um, I think it's, it's time for BYOB. Uh, like we like to say, bring your online beverage. If, you know, I have a beer and yes, Julia is saying, thank goodness for BYOB. Um, Darate says it means we're famous. So yes, I am a wine man, Riga. Uh, I have, I have a bottle of red sitting somewhere uh, in my house. Uh, do we, Alan, should we give everybody uh, maybe five, five minutes to go get their drinks and settle in and then let's unmute ourselves and have a drink together? <laughs> 